today we speak about uh, deep learning. Uh, in particular, our goal for this uh, for this discussion is to describe intuitively a few foundational aspects of uh, a class of learning algorithms that is deep learning, and uh, how they differ from other method methods, and uh, what type of um, of um, let's say problems for what type of problems this approach is more suited. Um, disclaimer, feel free to ignore the equations that you'll see in the slides. I, I, I've put a couple of them um, and I will refer to them from time to time only with the purpose of emphasizing that everything we discuss has a clear mathematical description, despite I will try to cast everything in intuitive terms. And therefore, um, it won't be in our interest today to dive into the math of uh, deep learning. So today's agenda is, is the one that you can see. In the first section, preliminary concepts uh, will develop an intuition of what a uh, model is and what uh, does it mean to train a model or to learn in this context. Um, the goal of the second section, uh, what is deep learning, is to identify a few important ideas that will bring us then to the core essence of deep learning. And in the last uh, section, uh, I'll quickly introduce some applications of deep learning to emphasize that the versatility uh, of such fr uh, of this framework. Uh, but in tomorrow's session, uh, we will dive deep deeper into these more concrete um, aspects. Um, before every section, each of the, these three sections, uh, we will quickly uh, read through some initial definitions uh, of concepts that we'll be exploring more depth in the section itself. So let's start with the, the first section, preliminary concepts. Uh, a few important words for this section. We have model, a tool for making predictions or decisions based on input data. Uh, that you will, you will uh, uh, hear many times the words parameters of, or weights, uh, which are values or numbers within a model that are adjusted during the training process to improve its predictions. And if you see a few equations, these, these usually are identified by the letter W, which stays for weights. Then loss function, which is a measure of how a model, uh, model prediction uh, are far from the actual values. Uh, but we will see that this is something, this is a definition that we can refine it and make it a bit better and more general. And training learning, the process of adjusting the numbers, the parameters that we mentioned already, and the complexity. Complexity in general is a model's capacity to capture uh, a wide range of patterns or behavior, essentially. So let's start from what is a model. We already introduced it as a mathematical framework uh, to process input data in order to make to take decisions based on the on the data let me spend just a couple of words on what we mean with data what we mean with input data so in general in general data are have numbers uh, and uh, there are there are numbers organized in some way for example an input data for a model can be just a sequence of numbers for example the height and the age of a person or an image uh, which is just a table of numbers essentially still numbers or a sequence of, of strings uh, which means a text which ultimately is also embedded as numbers but we will want to dig more into this for now uh, or a network which is essentially a set of vertices linked together by edges uh, for example in an anti-money laundering problem we have accounts that are linked to other accounts uh, by transactions for example all of these can be potentially input data Let's also look at that picture below, which is uh, a very simple model uh, to get an intuition about what a model is, what a model does. So this is a model that tries to answer the following question. Given that today I observe a uh, specific weather, what will be tomorrow's weather? Uh, and for in this model, there are two possible states, uh, sunny or rainy. So what does this model say, uh, tell us? Well, if today is sunny, there is a 10% chance as you see in that blue arrow, uh, that tomorrow will be rainy and a 90% chance that tomorrow will still be sunny. And if today is rainy, there, there is a 50-50 essentially. Um, this is an example of a weather forecasting model, very simple one, but how to, let's say, what is the difference between a model and a machine learning model? Well, a machine learning model is just a model where we actually learn the parameters. So in this model here, you see these numbers, 50%, 10%, 90%. These may be the parameters of this model, for example, and this could be set manually based on our domain knowledge, our subjective belief on how the weather behaves, or this could actually be 
uh, trained on a set of historical observations. If we uh, apply the second approach, this will we will just doing, be doing machine learning essentially. Uh, we already saw what is what does training a, a model mean. So we have a loss function that somehow essentially um, quantifies how happy we are with the performance of a model. Um, and we try to minimize this uh, error or loss function, it's the same, same thing, um, during the training process. In the training process, we just change these numbers, these parameters, until they get to a configuration that yields a low error, essentially, according to our error function. This is a mathematical description of a simple error function, um, which is called the sum of squares error, essentially. Um, where that evaluates the distance between uh, the the predictions and the labels, let's say the target values. Um, the target values are essentially the values that, for a given input, we want the model to return. So, are the correct answers? In other words, let's say if we have data, we have inputs, and we have correct answers for each input, input, and we want the model in the end to return answers that are that match or that are very close to those that we consider to be the correct answers, right? And um, in this case, uh, this, this will be the case of a supervised learning problem. We will dive more into this definition later. Um, well, the error function changes uh, based on, the, on that uh, letter that you see, W, right? W are, is the configuration of weights. W means what are the numbers that the model is using to make a decision or taking or making a prediction. And as we change these numbers, the error function, so the error will change. And we may uh, get into some, config, some, configuration, some uh, configurations of parameters that are, that are quite satisfying to us, even if they are not the optimal. And this will be the local minimum, essentially. They are called local minimum of the error surface. Or we could ideally get to the best possible configuration of weights that returns to us the best possible model. Um, and that would be the global minimum, essentially. But this error surface can be very complex. There could be many local minimum. Uh, and, um, and this would make the problem more difficult, essentially, because it means that it's more difficult to converge to get to the global minimum, so to the globally optimal solution. Local minimum are essentially suboptimal solutions. And the complexity of this error surface, what does it depend on? Maybe you can make uh, you can make a guess. Um, so the the error sur surface depends on the weights, and the weights are not part of the of the answers. The, the weights are all part of the model. So what I want to exp express here is that the more complex is the model itself, and the more complex will like will be the the error function essentially. Not yeah, the error surface, let's say. So the models with the model's complexity, also the error complexity typically will increase. Now let's jump into the central question of our discussion. What is deep learning? Uh, what are the foundational aspects, characteristics of deep learning? Some more words here. We will still keep the complexity word. This, this will still be very relevant in this section. We introduce the word feature, which is an individual measure, measurable property or characteristic um, used as input for a model or any way describing somehow the input that we have for a model. Um, the word representation, that is the way data is transformed or encoded to be then efficiently processed by a model. So the representation is essentially the way uh, the input data is transformed so that it can be more useful to take fi a final decision in a way. And a hierarchical representation essentially uh, just extends this concept into a, a multi-layered encoding of data, which means as, uh, where higher levels capture more abstract and complex concepts from lower level features, which means essentially that we build up descriptions uh, that will be useful for us to take a decision. But these descriptions uh, have a hi hierarchy. Uh, higher level descriptions are composition of lower level descriptions, but we will see this better. And then we have the word transfer learning uh, that we will also discuss quickly. Uh, the process of applying knowledge uh, learned from one task to improve performance on a related but different task. Let's 
introduce first a simple problem. Now I want to dive more into these words and this concept that we already quickly introduced. So the simple problem is we have just um, data about two measurements of flowers called sepal weight and sepal length. And we have these measurements, this pair of measurements for many flowers. So this means that we have many data points. We know um, already for these data, for these flowers, what type of fl flowers they are. And we have three possible classes, three possible types of flowers that here are just colored as um, red, green, and blue. Uh, so based on uh, on what type of flower they, they are, they will have a color in this diagram that you see here. And the one point in this diagram represents essentially identifies one specific configuration of sepal width and sepal length. For example, a point in the um, bottom left corner of this diagram will have short sepal length and short sepal width, essentially. So how do we uh, how do we approach such a problem? Uh, what is the problem here? Uh, maybe you see in that diagram that uh, not far from the center there is a cross, essentially. The cross represents a point that now we want to classify. This is a classification problem because for a new point that are, is not present already in our data, so essentially for a new flower for which we have sepal width and sepal length, we want to be able to say what is the class of that flower only based on these two measurements. Um, essentially, this is what we want to do. Uh, we want, uh, this is an, a simple approach that we can follow. Uh, we have this grid of configurations of width and length, and we start uh, coloring different regions of this grid with uh, the colors for each um, class. So in this case, the little cross that you see close to the center of the diagram will be classified as uh, red, essentially, because that cross belongs to a region in the grid that has many red points inside. So the most of the, the of the flowers in that regions are red. And so it's like a voting system, right? Where in a way where uh, the, the points each, uh, are in each element of the grid are voting uh, their own class and the, the highest number of class will be assigned also to the new point that we are trying to classify. This is uh, formalized as something called fixed basis function model. Um, for now, just the, the word fixed here is important and we will see uh, in a bit. And in this desc mathematical description, you see that we have X, which represents the input essentially. It's the, the, the represents the set of features describing the input, in this case, only sepal width and sepal length, and W, which is, uh, again, represents the, the weights that we are modifying during the training in order to converge to a satisfying model. And the features here in this uh, formulation um, represent, each feature represent a square in this grid, essentially. So this is a problem that can be satisfying for this specific case because we have only, we have only two uh, measurements. Uh, the number of, the, the amount, let's say the number of numbers that we need to uh, describe an input, in this case is two, width and length, uh, is the is also called the dimensionality of the input space. So the input space is the region is the space in which inputs can be essentially inputs input point points live, and the dimensionality of the space is the number of um, descriptions that we have in our input. So sepal width and sepal length are two. Therefore, the, the dimensionality for this input is two. Um, what is the problem with this approach uh, of dividing the, 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 the total space in a, into a grid and then assigning a color to each element of the grid. This is quite subtle. It's a difficult question. I, I just want to give you like a few seconds to think a moment about it. What could be a problem with this approach? Uh, if anybody wants to make a guess, just make a guess. Otherwise, we will just go to the solution. I like this approach, Francesco. Anyone is welcome to, to interact with Francesco at this point. So feel free. Even just thinking about the question for a few seconds, I, I think that will just consolidate the question and get people ready for receiving the answer in a way, right? So let's step into the answer. So this, the, also the answer is a bit subtle. Um, the number of required features grows exponentially with the dimensionality. What does it mean? So um, 
the feature in this case uh, represented essentially um, a square in this grid, right? And for each feature, we will need a parameter in the model telling us how important is that feature in a way. But what happens when we, now we add two measurements. What happens when we start adding more measurements to the definition of an input? So the uh, we um, increase the number of measurements that we use to describe a single flower. Well, let's start from the simplest case. L let's look at this picture here. On the left, we have an input space with dimensionality one, which means that we only use one number to describe a flower. In, um, for example, only the sepal length, right? And in this case, for example, we have three regions in our input space. And therefore, we will need three features in our model, and so three weights, three parameters to uh, describe our model. If we increase the number of features uh, to two, which is the case that we already uh, introduced here, we will have our space, for example, divided into uh, nine, squ nine squares, essentially, uh, three times three. And therefore, we need now nine features in our, our model and nine parameters. If we increase uh, the number of features to three, we will need 27. Uh, 27 uh, parameters in, in our model. So the, the issue here is that the more the, the, the longer the description that we use to, uh, for inputs, the more uh, the more um, numbers we use to describe inputs, and the more uh, parameters we'll need in our model. But it's not the problem is not that we need more parameters. The problem is how this number of parameters scales how this number of parameters grows, which is exponential, essentially, because it, in this case, it's three times three times three, and so on. Um, so if, if we add an, uh, 100 measurements for a flower, we will need a space of three to the 100, and a model that has three to, to the 100 uh, parameters, which is definitely a problem. Imagine just a simple, a very uh, small picture of 100 times 100 pixels. Already this picture is described by 100 times 100 numbers, which is 10,000, right? Uh, and so uh, this is an issue with this model. And the root cause of this feature explosion is that features are fixed. They do not adapt to the task, essentially, because we define the features into a grid. Essentially, we define the grid even before we look at the data. We define that uh, this grid has, in this case, 16 squares into that. And then, we, thanks to the data, we will color them. But the number of squares is actually predefined. So how to solve this problem? Um, this model that we introduced here, the fixed basis function model, can also be represented like this. So let's describe it intuitively. We have, on the left, the features that we use to describe the input data. Uh, on the right, we have y of x and w, which means essentially this is the, po the, 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 the place where we take our decision on what is the color, uh, sorry, what is the class that uh, a new input point belongs to. And as you see, we also have these edges that essentially uh, with a w on the top, that means that we are using parameters to take the decision, the decision y, based on the input features on the left. So. Um, OK, we, so we just described this is a representation of the model that we just saw. But this has a fixed um, uh, fixed features, essentially. Features do not adapt on the problem, do not adapt on the data. They are decided before, even before we look at the data. Um, this is how we can solve the problem. Let me say, observe a couple of things here in this picture. So on the right side, we still have outputs, right? Uh, it's, here, it's not important that we have one output y or k outputs y from y1 to yk it's not important let's consider that as the decision layer that the layer where we take we make our prediction based on some numbers essentially now this decision layer does not depend directly on the input layer does not depend directly on the inputs it depends on something in the middle on those called hidden units essentially that are processed starting from the inputs, because as you see, the edges are feeding the inputs into those hidden units through some weights. So here, I don't want to dive too deeply into this picture, but what I want 
to show you is that what we can do now is instead of using the, directly the input to take a decision, um, what we do is we use the input to create some new features that can be learned because we associate weights to them. And these new features will then be used to take a decision. This is just an intuitive formulation of what essentially the deep learning is doing. And this, uh, well, this I gave an, I made a question here, but I already <laughs> told, uh, told you the answer. Um, and this is what is bringing us to the to the main equation in this talk, which is we remember. Let's let's recover uh, retrieve the que initial question: What is deep learning? And deep learning is hierarchical representation, or be better, learning hierarchical representation. We already introduced the word hierarchical representation, which means essentially that we build layers of features where the features at a given layer is a composition of the features of, of, of the layer coming before. Uh, let me give a more intuitive, let's say, and also visual example of this. Here you see many layers stuck together starting from an image and bringing to a classification. For example, we say that the, the, the person in this picture is Sara. On the, on the last layers, we have um, some, let's say, faces or let's say traits of faces, right? And the decision is taken based on how well, or let's say on, on these last features. Um, so if uh, what we see is that the specific input is matching a few of these, um, let's say, proto faces in this last grid on the right, we can say it's it's Sarah. Otherwise, we will say another name. But these elements, these features, are built as a composition of features that are lower level that you can see in the in the picture in the second last picture there, which are representing components of a face, which are you see uh, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, and so on, and these features are themselves built on the base uh, uh, based on lower even lower level features which are essentially catching edges of a, of a picture essentially once we have this hierarchy of representation which means that we process a feature into something which is more useful and then we process it again into something which is even more useful and then we process it again until we get to a set of features that is very helpful for us to take a decision once we have this hierarchy, what we can do is to leverage this to uh, transfer some knowledge from one problem to another. And essentially, let's let's look at this uh, at this picture here. We train a stack of representations here, starting from a, a cat in this case. Well, to classify the cat, and we do this. Maybe we learn this deep learning model on a very a uh, large data set with many pictures and many different classes and so on. So this data set maybe has uh, pictures of trees or, ca or cats, dogs, chairs, tables, uh, and, and all kind of objects, essentially. And we learn a model to perform well on this data, on classifying many different objects. And now we are we have a new problem, a very dif uh, quite different one. So we want to do something called skin cancer classification, for example. We take a picture and we want to say if that picture represents a cancer or something that is not uh, dangerous, essentially. But maybe we have a few data. Uh, maybe we have a few data. Uh, what can we do? So we can actually, there are some representations that are quite general for every picture, uh, and which are, for example, in this here, in this diagram here, you can see the edges on the left. The very first la layer of a representation is learning edges uh, patterns. Edges are typically present in any picture that has a meaning for us, that we can associate with some pattern or meaning, essentially. Um, and therefore, for example, we can still, we could say, okay, we don't need to learn ed to, to, to spot edges again, because we already learned it through in, in the first model. So let's take the first model. Let's cut it on the, uh, on the, on a middle layer where we already process, are processing the edges. We do this cut. These in the second uh, image uh, are essentially the red layers, layers that have been already trained to uh, recognize patterns related to edges. And then we add some two new layers in the end, 
that instead we will train and uh, in a way that now that the, the final pro, uh, the final uh, uh, model will be specific for classifying uh, for doing skin, skin cancer detection now um, let me quickly go through um, a few applications uh, of these models again tomorrow we will see better if, if you're attending tomorrow's session uh, we'll discuss more about the applications but now we will just quickly uh, summarize um, what we are going to uh, discuss better tomorrow here we have I have a ba very basic question sorry <laughs> Can we can please you go contain back to... just a sec? Can we please contain the questions at the very end so that I mean <laughs> we can uh, conclude okay. this part and then sorry about that. Okay, so um, um, let's introduce quickly a few words: transfer learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and self-supervised. So essentially, these are different ways. Well, transfer learning we already dis discussed. Um, supervised learning essentially means learning a model by providing it with input-output pairs and letting it learn the, to map an input to the correct answer. At the beginning of this session, I, I, just, I, I was talking about correct answers, right? This is the supervised learning scenario. Unsupervised learning is learning patterns from data without explicit input-output pairs, so without having correct answers. And then self-supervised learning means that we extract the correct answers from the input. Let's see a bit better what it means. So, I will spend just a few words on supervised learning because actually all the cases that we already considered in today's uh, discussion were supervised learning, uh, classifying flowers, uh, or um, the, 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 in the transfer learning, classifying, uh, doing skin cancer uh, classification, which is also these examples essentially. And here I just want to highlight that the inputs for this problem are images of moles or skin cancer. Uh, the output, so the the uh, the answers of the model are uh, essentially classes either for example this as this uh, um, picture represents um, a, a mole or uh, you, you see some names there are melanoma or something like that and in this as we already discussed this is a problem where we can apply transfer learning and this is supervised because we have the correct classification for each input image in our data set so we learn how to map the one to the other. Another supervised learning uh, problem is a, a more complex one, and I just want to quickly highlight this just to show you how actually flexible, flexible we can be in this framework is uh, the protein structure classification, which means we have a sequence of amino acids, um, which are described with some letters or anything, and we want to predict what will be the final 3D structure of this sequence of amino acids? And this has been a op um, fundamental open problem in biology for uh, for many years. And recently, uh, there was a breakthrough in this problem, which was essentially brought by DeepMind with a model called AlphaFold, which is actually able with uh, good good performance to classify to map a sequence of amino acids into a 3D structure. This is key because actually doing it experimentally is very it requires a lot of resources and one and so on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then unsupervised learning. Essentially, we don't need labels in this problem. For example, the, we try to build new uh, faces, essentially. And as we will see tomorrow, for this problem, we don't need actual labels. We use the inputs itself as labels in order to try to reconstruct uh, them. But we will see better tomorrow because this will would require a longer discussion. And then self-supervised learning. Everybody now knows ChatGPT and so on. And this is self super What is the difference between unsupervised and self-supervised? Self Here, this is a form of unsupervised learning where the model learns the input data itself, uh, through, let's say, using uh, learns through the input data itself. So creating its own supervision signal from the input data. This often involves uh, designing uh, tasks where the model predicts, for example, um, the input from the whole input from other parts of the input and uh, leveraging inherent structures and patterns in the data also this is something that we are going to uh, going to discuss better tomorrow so um the fundamental i will just not make the question i, I am going to conclude this i'm already a bit late so what is the fundamental difference between all of these three cases one could say oh because we have 
uh, we have labels, we don't have labels. But the mo more fundamental way to describe this is that the loss function is changing. The way we define, quantify the goodness of a performance changes. And then what do they have in common? Well, typically all of these problems have input data that are high dimensional. We discussed about the problems for a simple approach to have high dimensional data. Well, in these approaches, we have high data points that are uh, described by many numbers, like images, for example. So quick conclusions, just four short sentences that will summarize everything we just discussed. With deep, lear with deep learning, we can efficiently tackle complex problems involving unstructured data. So data that are complex, not just a couple of numbers, but images or uh, amino acid sequ sequences and more. To do it, these models are able to learn efficient representation of the data that are hierarchical. And therefore we can also apply transfer learning as we saw. Some learning uh, representation can be shared among different problems. And this is the transfer learning setting. And finally, deep learning is a very rich class of methods and yields state-of-the-art performance in many fields. Okay, I finished.